first thing I should say is, do you need the microphone? Would it be helpful? It does. Okay. And so I need to know one God is what's required. You know, I have a brother who's an audiologist, um, and he said that whenever I speak to an audience that contains people as young as this, that I should always make sure that I ask the you know, those. Um, you know, if you do like a good audiologist, they're being rolled straight bendigo. <laughs> Um, the second thing I should make sure of is, because this is being filmed, um, I actually got the screen of the room, so I shouldn't be moving too far. So, stay up on that. That's my stay up on that. <laughs> I feel that uh, I'm not going to go to tether to this thing, so, but I will, uh, I may move a little bit. So, but if you can't hear anything, please, uh, and let me know. Um, so, Greg Divorce my name. And yes, I work as a psychiatrist uh, in Sydney at Westfield Hospital, which is a massive hospital. There's about 1,000 beds, probably the biggest medical complex in the country. And I flew down yesterday, and I thought you should know a little bit about myself as well as the story of John Cade, because I actually grew up not far from here. I grew up in a place called Merlinston. I don't know if anyone knows North Cove. I went to Rollinston State School, and then I went to a school which I think is now defunct, Faulkner High School. And that was a pretty rough school, as I recall. And then I was fortunate enough to win a scholarship, and I went to the other side of the city, and a scholarship to go to a school called Wesley College, and I studied medicine at Melbourne University. And then I fled Melbourne North to, to Sydney, which is where I live. I'm delighted to be here today because the story you're about to hear, I believe, is the most significant story in the history of the mental health, in our history, in our national history. The discovery of lithium for bipolar disorder is really the kind of penicillin story for mental health. Lithium was the first effective medication for any mental illness discovered anywhere in the world. And all the classes of medication we use today, in 2021, were discovered in the next decade or so after the discovery of lithium. But the first was lithium, and it happened here, Bandura, Melbourne, Victoria. So it's a story that's dear to my heart. So today I want to tell you a little bit about, I should mention, I'm assuming maybe incorrectly that everyone knows what bipolar disorder is, but I might just mention it briefly. So as a psychiatrist, pretty much every day of my professional life I'm seeing people with mood disorder, depression, and bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is a serious, long-term mental illness. It usually begins in the 20s, but it can occur really younger and also later in life. It is characterised by long periods of significant low mood. I'm not just talking about sadness, I'm talking about deep despair, which can affect eating, sleep, thoughts about the future, and of course, suicidal thinking. It can also present itself in what we call a manic state, where someone is very elevated. By that I mean perhaps feeling excessively happy or agitated or not so much happy but often aggressive but in a way where their whole mechanism of the individual is sped up. People will speak quickly. They sometimes have fantastic ideas about who they are and what they came from. A century ago, that period where someone is elevated typically lasted for something like 13 months, and people would die from just what we call psychotic exhaustion because we couldn't slow down. So, this illness, bipolar disorder, which used to be called the manic depression, is long term and it kind of oscillates throughout a lifetime. And that's what we're talking about. To kick off today, I really wanted to talk to you a bit about how I got involved with the story of writing the biography of Dr. John Kane and what it meant to me. Because I think getting into psychiatry for me was not straightforward. 
and it illustrates a lot about attitudes towards mental illness. I should also mention that I'm not sure where Shannon is. I'm guessing that Shannon there from your furtive smile when you mentioned earlier. Um, that's the thing about being a psychiatrist, you do tend to scan the audience and just how wonderful it is that you have such creative and thoughtful energy to put to this, this effort. So thank you very much for all your artistic work. So how, do, how does a psychiatrist get involved with writing a story like this? I'm going to take you through that and what it means to me, what it means to my family to be a psychiatrist, because I was a straight You know, when I tell people I'm a psychiatrist, a lot of people are not certain about what they're going to expect, but as you can see, I'm fairly reasonable and pretty normal. But I know when I was a medical student at Melbourne University, I told you how I got there from Wesley, and, you know, my mum and dad had migrated from Sri Lanka. And when you come from Sri Lanka as migrants, I was born here in Melbourne, and your son happens to be very good at mathematics and science, which was me, and happens to win a scholarship to go to Wesley College, and then you go to Melbourne University and study medicine, they expect you to do something respectable. <laughs> a surgeon would be really good, Greg. <laughs> if you don't like blood, cardiology. <laughs> I was a terrible medical student. I was very hard to touch Wesley, but I found myself in first year medicine and I really didn't know what I was doing. And for years, I never attended lectures and I'd just scrap in the last minute and get through exams. When I got to fifth year, there was eight weeks of psychiatry. Now I knew even before I did this that I was not going to like psychiatry. So I wasn't going to turn up for any lectures at all. <laughs> the true story, for the first seven weeks I didn't turn up to a single tutorial or lecture. One week to go, I thought, hmm, I better do something to pass this exam. So I turned up my first tutorial, it was about this size, and I was sitting right here in this front seat, you know it is, and the lecturer was in front of me. And he looked down at me, and I could see that he'd never seen me before. He said, who the hell are you? <laughs> and I said, my name is Greg Damore. I'm a fifth year medical student. <laughs> I've been here for the last seven weeks. He said, no, you haven't. <laughs> and as punishment, he made me stay back at the hospital. I was at Royal Melbourne. He said, as punishment, he said, you've got to stay back and you've got to see your first psychiatric patient. I knew it was August. And of course, August in Melbourne, unlike Sydney, is dark and cold and bleak. Mm. And I always remember that night late in August, Royal Melbourne Hospital, the ward was one north, it was a psychiatric unit in Royal Melbourne. And I stayed there, and it was six o'clock in the evening, and the police just decanted a 22 year old young man who'd been found walking along Black Rock Beach, I think if I remember correctly. Um, and he had been found walking along Black Rock talking to himself, muttering to himself, this 22-year-old young man. He was going through his first episode of psychosis. He actually had no diagnosis. Turns out to be schizophrenia. Neighbours had complained, the police picked him up and brought him to a Royal Melbourne Hospital. And I always remember the police bringing him into a room where I sat by myself to do my first psychiatric interview as punishment. And for the next one hour, the lecturer left, and I sat with this 22-year-old man. For the next hour, there were two terrified 22-year-old males. <laughs> I was in one corner, and my patient was in the other corner. At the end of that single hour, I walked out of that room, and I thought, bloody hell, that's the most interesting thing I've done in five years of cancer. And I jumped on the tram outside in a wall parade, I jumped on the tram, and I remember standing and this was going through my mind. This is the only thing in five years of medicine that I've really thought I liked. And I resolved by the time I got to Baker's Road, I don't know if you know, it's the top end of North Coburg, I jumped off the tram and turned this, and I started walking all the way back to Rocky Avenue Mills, which is a 20 minute walk in the dark. 
And I kept on thinking, I'm going to be a psychiatrist. Now I've got to tell mum and dad. <laughs> so I got home, and that night, it was just myself and my parents, and we were eating chops and sausages that were trying to be good Australians. <laughs> and they were really hard chops, you know, sort of thing you could bang on the side of the table. And halfway through, I turned to mum and dad, and I said, I'm going to be a psychiatrist. Yeah, you've got a thing from Nothing was said. So I raised my voice and said, Mum, I'm going to do some countries. My mum, who had just seen the film Psycho, <laughs> well, it's a true story. And it's sort of sad in some ways, but it's true. She looked at me and she said, You can't do that. I should mention to you, as I myself, um, reveal a little bit about our family history. We have significant psychiatric history. So when mum heard me wanting to be a psychiatrist, she said, you can't do that. Her great fear was that her son was going to lose his mind. And she said that to me. I then said to her, this is what I really like to do. Now my father had been totally silent at the end of the table for the last 10 minutes. And in the, mere, the manner of women of her generation, my mum turned to my father and said, Desmond, it's time you said something. <laughs> my dad looked up and he was still chomping on his sausages and he said, son, you're wanting to be a psychiatrist. is like the hula hoop. It's a fad and it'll soon pass away. Yeah. You know, ladies and gentlemen, when I looked at my mum and dad and I saw that they both disagreed with what I wanted to do, I knew immediately that I was on the right path. <laughs> The next day I went back to the Royal Melbourne Hospital and I think for the first time in five years I went to the library and I found a small book called Mending the Mind, written by John Kay. And in it there was a chapter about the discovery of lithium for bipolar disorder. So he wrote this book. He made this discovery. But what was remarkable was that in this book he did not mention that he was the discoverer of lithium for bipolar disorder. It was a kind of humility that characterised John Kay and is so foreign to the world we live in now, where anyone who makes a minor discovery is on the internet within 30 microseconds. I was always affected by that book, and that idea incubated for decades until I got the opportunity in the last few years to write his story. The story of John Kay really begins the early part of the 20th century. He was born in 1912 in Western Victoria. Now clearly I can't tell you his whole story, but he grew up, his father was a local GP. His father went off to war, World War I. It was in Gallipoli, it was the Western Front, and was profoundly affected by a thing they called back then shell shock in our post-traumatic stress disorder. So after the First World War, when John Kay's father came back from war, he was so affected by shell shock that he couldn't continue being a GP. So John's father elected to work as a mental health doctor in a large asylum in Beechworth. I don't know if you know the town of Beechworth that well, but there's a massive asylum there on top of the hill. So after the First World War, that's where John's father took the family. Now, why that's important is that John Kay, as a young kid, lived on the grounds of mental hospitals. And it profoundly affected his life. He got to know and understand the patients in those hospitals. First, as people. Secondly, as patients. And it was a sensitivity and warmth of understanding that he carried with him his whole professional life. In one of his silence, someone taught him how to play tennis, another one taught him how to box. So it was a warm and friendship for him. Of course, the family later then moved to Melbourne, he went to Scotch College, he went to Melbourne University. He had a brief flirtation of wanting to be a pediatrician, and unfortunately, he suffered a very serious pneumonia. By that point, he almost died. The legacy of that, though, was that he did leave his future wife who nursed him to help at that time. But he went through an epiphany when he had bilateral pneumonia when he was a young doctor. 
uh, with pneumonia. He decided that he would become a mental health doctor, a psychiatrist. So when he recovered in the late 1930s, using his late 20s, he went up to Beechworth again as a young doctor. This was just before the, first of the Second World War. Now, when he went up to Beechworth just before the Second World War as a young doctor, you have to understand, for a period of time, he was the only doctor for over 1,000 patients. The idea of care just did not exist. There was not a single effective medication he could use to treat any of those patients. Not one. The only treatment that had just come out was a very crude form of what we call ECT, electric convulsive therapy, shock therapy, which was given by a um, barbaric way in the 1930s. World War II came, and John Kane, like his father, signed up with the Australian Army, like his father had during the First World War. And in 1941, he left his wife and two young children in Melbourne, and bravely, courageously, he sailed with the Australian Army and went to Singapore and the Malaysian Peninsula to wait for the Japanese to attack. He waited there for quite some time until the Japanese duly attacked. The Allies were hopelessly prepared and the Japanese pushed the Australians, the British, the Dutch and others down that Malaysian peninsula into the island fortress of Singapore. On several occasions during that time, John Cade thought that he would be killed, executed. And the day before capitulation, he wrote that he expected not to wake up the following day that he would be killed by the Japanese. No one was more surprised than himself when he woke up lying, sleeping next to uh, his ambulance, and he was still alive. The day of capitulation, he and thousands of other Australians, Dutch and British, were marched into the prison of war camp, which we call Changi. So those of you who know Singapore, Changi is really in the northeast corner of the island of Singapore. Now, it proved to be an effective prisoner of war camp because one side was the ocean, and clearly weren't going to escape on that side, and the other side was ringed by a barbed wire, and all the prisoners were told that they were executed if they were found beyond the barbed wire. For three and a half hideous years, that's where John Kay lived. Food was central to his life. He lost a lot of weight, his men lost a lot of weight. But he was remarkably brave, and so were the other individuals. Sometimes they would go beyond the barbed wire and find jungle food. Jungle pipelines, bring it back to the camp, cook it, and give it to themselves and, and their men. He was also a remarkable man in terms of his, his memory, his ability to recall things. He's famously recalled for listening to BBC radio broadcasts, memorising the broadcasts, and then reciting the broadcast to his men to raise their morale. Now these radio broadcasts, of course, were highly forbidden by the Japanese. So the Australians would hide these receivers in the cavities of walls and other places. And of course, if he had been found out, he would have been executed. But he did this for his men. He was highly, highly regarded. He had the invidious task of trying to work out which Australian soldier should go and work on the tide of her battle. Initially, he thought he was sending men to a better life. It was only when these men either did not return or came back from their school that he realised that many of these men actually passed away and left in the top of the world. In an extraordinary event when we were researching this, we discovered that in the middle of Singapore, in Chang Prisoner of War Camp, in the Southeast Asian jungle, amongst humidity and constant moisture, they set up a psychiatry. John Kay ran a 10 bed psychiatry in Channel Prison of War Camp. Something that's almost unbelievable when you think about it. He looked after men who were suicidal, who were depressed. Often patients there were psychotic because of nutritional deficiency. But the key thing was that during that three and a half years he ran this mental health unit. It changed his view about the cause of mental illness. 
Peace or mental illness there caused by physical changes to the body. In other words, some nutritional deficiencies, for example, might have caused someone to be depressed or psychotic, hearing voices or imagining things. And at the end of that three and a half years, he really decided that some serious mental illnesses, like bipolar disorder, could be caused by physical change to the body. See, at the time, you have to understand, it was often thought that illnesses, for example, like bipolar disorder, were the result of upbringing, the way your mother in particular, and sometimes your father, raised you. Now, while all that's important, Kay moved to the view that it may be a physical cause leading to the mental illness, and not just your upbringing. When, he, when the war came to an end, when the planes, the American planes, lumbered towards Hiroshima and Nagasaki and dropped their bombs, he again thought that he would be executed by the Japanese. But instead, the Japanese fled Changi, the gates were opened, and soon after he was sailing back to Melbourne. He wrote this wonderful letter to his wife, who was in suburban Melbourne at that time, saying that whilst he was in Changi, he'd had some ideas about the causation of bipolar disorder. And he couldn't wait to put that to the test when he came home. When he came home, damaged in many ways, emaciated, and Jack Cade would perhaps talk about what he looked like when he returned. Nonetheless, soon after he returned to work, he came to this site to work. At the time, there were approximately 200 male patients, all ex diggers, so from the First World War and Second World War actually living here as patients. And again, for a period of time, he was the only doctor after the Second World War. But you have to remember what it was like. We're talking about 1945, 46. He comes back here. And he's living in the family house, which is about 200 metres away, just past the oval we would have driven past. He's got his wife there, he's got two young children. Comes back 45, 46. As I said, there's not a single effective treatment. Medicated for any illness. I just sort of highlight what it was like back then, and it was illustrated for me by one story that I'd like to, to tell you about. When I was writing this book, I actually flew down from Sydney to Melbourne and drove to Beechworth Hospital. And I spoke to a nurse who had since retired, but she was working in the 1970s at Beechworth Hospital. She said, Greg, I can tell you what it was like through the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s to be a psychiatric nurse. She said, in 1975, we were looking after a patient, her name was Rose. She'd been in that hospital at Beechworth since the 1940s. So she had 30 years in Beechworth Medical Hospital, from the 40s to the 70s. The nurse went on to say, Greg, this patient Rose, she had a terrible life. We couldn't really treat her psychosis as well. The only pleasure she had was every Saturday afternoon when the VFL came on. And her favourite team, Collingwood, was playing. And she could put on a little transistor and listen to this football game. The game was over and she'd be psychotic again. One day that transistor broke down and the nurse said to Rose, Rose, I'll get this transistor fixed. So the nurse takes the transistor in 1975, walks down the hill, from the medical hospital at Beechworth to the little electrical repair shop in Beechworth, which was just down the bottom of the hill, 300 metres away. Hands it to the technician who says, come back in one week and you can pick up the transistor. One week later, the nurse goes back, picks up the transistor, and as he hands the transistor to the nurse, he said, there's something very unusual about this transistor, and turns around and looks at the back and says, the name of the patient who owns this transistor is an unusual surname. It turned out that her surname was exactly the same surname as the technician who repaired it. It also turned out that she was the technician's sister, and he had no idea that his sister had been in that asylum for 30 plus years. It's a true story. What we discovered when we researched this was that he also had gone off to the Second World War, was also in Chandler Prison of War Camp.
And whilst he was there, he received a letter from his mum and dad saying that his sister had been killed in a car accident. She hadn't been killed in a car accident. She'd given birth to a child, had become mentally unwell, and remained with the first years. The nurse told me, through tears, what it was like to bring brother and sister back together. The reason I'm telling you this story is that that was the world of mental hospitals just after the Second World War. People were often left for days, weeks, months, years, a lifetime in these hospitals. So Cade comes back and thinks, what can he do? When we spoke to John Cade's uh, wife, Jean, he was determined to find something about depression and bipolar disorder. So he looked at the patients here at Bandura to try and work out what could he, what could he find to treat people who need to see. Now he had this idea, you know, he said bipolar disorder, sometimes you're high, sometimes you're low. He had this idea that when you were high, you were manic. Maybe you had a chemical coursing through your body that was in excessive quantities. But when you were depressed, maybe somehow you had been depleted. It was low. So we had this idea that this chemical was coursing through your body. Who did you identify? That's what he wanted to know. So he had this idea that if he could collect the urine of all the patients with bipolar disorder, you might be able to analyse the urine and find the substance that caused them to be high, when in excess, and caused them to be depressed when they didn't have enough of this substance. So he asked the nursing staff to collect urine from all the bipolar patients at Bandura here, and he collected them in containers, bottles, and then he put them in the family fridge in the home, which is just on the other side. Now, I always thought that the hidden heroine in the story is Jean Cade's wife. So I don't know how many women would really tolerate with uh, loads of urine-filled bottles in your fridge. And I remember speaking to Jack and his younger brother David, who were in primary school in the late 1940s, and they would say, Greg, when we came back from primary school and we wanted to make a Vegemite sandwich, we'd come back to the fridge and we'd have to push aside Mr. Smith's urine to buy a <laughs> And I remember saying to Jack, I don't know if Jack remembers, I said, Jack, didn't you think it was very odd that your home fridge was filled with urine? And I remember Jack's comment, he said, no, Greg, we thought like everyone's fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so he was collecting urine, and then what he did with the urine is he drew it up into syringe, and then he had guinea pigs, real guinea pigs, and he would inject these urine into his guinea pigs. And what he convinced himself was that the urine that he took from bipolar patients was more toxic when compared to other patients of bone He had this idea that the bipolar patients, their urine contained this magical substance that caused bipolar illness and it killed the guinea pigs. So he wanted to look at this urine more carefully. Now I won't go into the chemical aspect of it, but in urine there's a substance called uric acid. It's an acid. We've all got it. And he thought that this was implicated both in the death of the guinea pigs he was ejecting, and he thought it was also implicated in the causation of bipolar disorder. So he wanted to look at uric acid more closely. Now, to manipulate uric acid chemically, it's quite difficult. So you've got to make it more soluble. And the way he did that was to add lithium. Because if you add lithium to uric acid, you get a thing called lithium and you can make it really concentrated, you can make it really diluted, and you can do experiments. That's where lithium came into the story. Almost on pass on, he was to do a chemical uh, experiment. When he looked at adding lithium to the urine, he decided in the process that when he was injecting his guinea pigs, as a control, as a comparison, what would happen if I injected a solution of lithium? into the guinea pigs. No urine, just lithium. What would happen? So he stirred up a solution of lithium, which used to be used for gout, by the way, so it was in the old pharmacy, so he had access to it. But he stirred up a solution of lithium, drew it up into his syringe, injected it into guinea pigs. That's when the medical world changed. Because the guinea pigs, A, didn't die, and B, they became quiescent. We interviewed Jean Kay, his wife, and she can remember the very day 
John Cade raced back from this uh, pantry, kitchen that they were using, just not far from here, raced back into their family home and said, Gee, come and look at this guinea pig. She was, she said she was dragged by the arm back into his old kitchen, wondering what's going on. And he picked up this guinea pig, turned it on its back, and it just remained like that. It didn't write itself, it didn't wriggle around. He instantly thought that if with him could quell a guinea pig like that, maybe he could quell the, the psychotic agitation of the patients around him. Now, it was a leap of faith in lots of ways. You have to remember in 1946, 47, 48, when he was doing these experiments here, there was no ethics committee. The only person he had to answer to was himself and his own conscience. So secretly, without telling anyone, including his wife, John Cade stirred up a solution of lithium and over two to three weeks took lithium to see what would happen to himself. It's sort of craziness and courage all at the same time. And he didn't die, he didn't collapse, he didn't uh, uh, go down in convulsions. He had a mild gastric upset, but he was well. After two to three weeks of that, he resolved to find a patient to give with him to see what would happen. He looked over the back fence, and amongst the 200 plus patients, he picked out a man called Bill Brand, William Brand. He was nicknamed the monkey by the nursing staff here, which was an unfortunate name, and it took to also about the way people were regarded. He was called the monkey because he'd often rifled through rubbish cans and looking for things. How the famous story about Bill is that he was untreatable. Now, I went back to the original notes from 1948. The doctors regarded him as untreatable, in fact, making up a lot of his symptoms. Very unsympathetic view. He'd been in and out of hospitals for 30 plus years. Famously, at one point, he raced outside to one of the local cinemas, and before the movie was shown, he sang, God save the king, stripping himself naked in one of his many states. He'd often race off the, the Bandura grounds and go into the city. He was a nuisance to everyone. Everyone knew Bill Brown. He had this long history of bipolar disorder, and it was he that John Cade picked to give him to. In March 1948, not telling anyone, John Cade mixed a solution of lithium, we didn't have tablets back then, and over a period of six weeks, he gave lithium to Bill Brown. He asked the nursing staff to watch Bill, and within six to eight weeks, every single hallucination, delusion, thought disorder that had afflicted Bill over 30 years had that broken. And within another month, Bill Brown walked out of this hospital and saying, as you were right, back to his old job. His family were astounded. John Kane was astounded. John Cade mixed that solution and gave it to nine other manic patients. Manic, psychotic, agitated, aggressive. One was a local GP who went back after recovery with him to see patients. Another was an editor with the Melbourne Hill. Another was a local car salesman. All ten patients who had bipolar disorder essentially resolved completely. Nothing had been seen like that in the history of the world. And it happened here. He wrote it up, published it in the Medical Journal of Australia. It was hot and hot. There's a lot I can say about John Cade, and obviously in the limited time I'm just going to finish with a couple of things, but there is a tragic thread to the story. A short period of time after Bill Brand went out, the first patient of treatment for he returned, brought in by his family, as psychotic and as disturbed as he always been. John Cade was a crestfallen, thinking that Lithia would stop working. But what had happened was this. Bill Bragg thought he was so well from Lithia, he didn't need medication. Mm -hmm. He stopped taking the medication and became unwell again. The sadness was this. Cade reintroduced Lithia, improved Bill back to his normal state, but you have to remember in the late 40s, 1950, we didn't know how much lithium to give. Cade, in his endeavour to get Bill Brown well, pushed lithium and pushed it too far. 
And if you give too much liquid, you can become toxic. And in 1950, Bill Brown died from lithium toxicity. John Cade was mortified, wondering what he had discovered when he let the genie out of the bottle and maybe lithium wasn't as good as he had hoped. The other nine patients, by the way, had done extremely well. There was a coronial inquest, and for a period of time he lost confidence, I think, in lithium. But there are other doctors in Melbourne, particularly based at Melbourne University, who discovered that if you took blood tests while someone's on lithium, you could work out exactly how much lithium to give, how much you needed to take to improve, and how much you should not take uh, to become toxic. And in the mid-50s, late-50s, early-60s, lithium took off in Australia and around the world. Cade, by the mid to late 50s, rekindled his interest in lithium. And in the 60s, was well known before this discovery, certainly within the medical profession. I think it's important to know that John didn't have a long life, not in terms of the way we measure life now. He died in 1980, of 68, from esophageal carcinoma, and probably a legacy of the cigarette smoking. His wife said to us that Chang cured him of many things, but it couldn't cure him of cigarette smoking. And she recalled to us how, when he was in Changi, he would scrounge around the dirt looking for the butts of cigarettes that the Korean, Japanese and Indian guards had thrown down and he had mashed together little cigarettes. So in 1980, this remarkable man passed away. When I was writing this book, towards the end of it, I wanted to find a photograph of Bill Brand, the first patient ever treated with him. Because although I found John Cain was a hero in my eyes, in many ways it was the patients who were the heroes. And none more so than Bill Brand, who was the first treatment. So as I was finishing writing the book, I wanted to find a photo of Bill, because there was no photo. And I had in my mind this image of this kind of person who was called the monkey, rummaging, rummaging around in garbage cans. So I tracked him down. It turns out that he was married in 1923 to a lovely woman called Pearl. When he became very unwell, she was threatened, she ran away and said that her first husband, Bill, had died. Because she couldn't get a divorce, because he was still alive, what uh, people would often do is that if someone was in the hospital, they would pretend their spouse had passed away. And that's what she did. She went up and fled to a little town called Underbull, which is near Algeria, in the middle of the mountains. And she remarried had a family, and I tracked down one of the children from her second marriage, who was in his 80s, he was a uh, wheat farmer. I ran into him in Sydney and I said, look, my name's Greg and we're on a psychiatrist. That pretty much guarantees <laughs> And I said, I'm trying to track down some information about Bill Brown, silence. I believe Bill was married to Pearl, your mum. And, and he said, yes, well, Pearl was married to Bill Brand and she had a second marriage and that was where I was born. And I chatted to him, I won him over the phone to agree. We do have one photograph of Bill Brand. Do you want to fly down from Sydney and have a look at it? So the next week I flew from Sydney to Melbourne, then I flew from Melbourne up to Mildura and drove three hours from the heart and down into a small town of Underville with 213 people. They lost their football team last year. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is the photo we found. Pearl, Bill Brand's wife, died some years ago. And we were going through her house. We found this photo. And he pulled out a photo that was about a metre high and half a metre across, an oval shape, in pristine condition. And there was Bill Brand and his wife, Pearl, in 1923, before he was mentally ill. And I looked at him and I thought, he looks so much like a boy. Like a mother would want to look after him and, and make his Vegemite sandwiches before he went off to school. And I looked at him and I thought, this is what he looked like as a young man before mental illness ravaged his life. My final thought was, I looked at him and I thought, if lithium had been around in 1923, his life would have been profoundly changed, and so were his lives. Lithium is not a perfect drug. 
It's a hell of a lot better than anything we have before. In 2021, for many patients, it still is the gold standard for severe bipolar disorder. It can have significant side effects, but it has saved hundreds of thousands of lives over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Whenever I go to schools and speak to kids, I tell them that they have heard, like you today, one amazing Australian story, a story we should all know about and be proud about. But I always like to tell them that they don't have to look to the United States or Britain or anywhere else for great and wonderful stories. We've got them here. And this great Australian story began right here where you Thank you very much. Truly um, insightful presentation, which I um, expected from you. Um, so, I would like to start with the in conversation element of this program. Um, it is my absolute great pleasure and honour um, to invite to um, take a seat. Um, perhaps over here would be good. Um, Dr. Oh, sorry, Professor Jack Hay. So, Jack is the eldest, of, actually, sorry, Professor Jack Hay, AM, MD. PhD, and I'm not exaggerating when I say probably about eight other um, <laughs> as well, <laughs> at all. Um, Jack is the eldest son of Dr. John Kay. Um, as a small boy, Jack lived here on site and observed many aspects that uh, his father's discovery that Greg has talked about, including the guinea pigs, the famous guinea pigs on their, um, lying contentedly on their back in the lab. Um, and not to mention the jars of urine as well, which we won't talk about anymore because we've covered that enough. But Jack graduated in medicine from the University of Melbourne and undertook postgraduate training at St Vincent's Hospital at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. He then worked in research in Canada where he became an associate professor of medicine, of medicine and pathology. And on his return to Australia, he was appointed as the inaugural director of intensive care at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, a position which he held for over 30 years. He is presently an Emeritus Consultant in Intensive Care at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and a Professional Fellow in Medicine in the University of Melbourne. I don't know how he has time to be with us today, but he's here and we're very pleased, so please welcome Jack. First of all, that was a wonderful question. And uh, I can tell you all it's quite true. <laughs> but just to, just to show you, because Sophie's put up a map physically where it all happened. Um, so John Kay came back to this as a mirror shop bunker in the 80s. Uh, not much change from the 40s. Came back as the sole superintendent of the hospital to his beloved ex deepers with a burning desire to the research with her. I need a pointer, I've got a pen. That helps. <laughs> this was where the family house was. Yeah, it's been pulled down now. Just yes. next to the oval. We are here. This is, and you can see the drive, etc. This is the Bunger homestead. All the hospital around it. And this is where the living that was. In this uh, building here, it's in the front door. In the front yeah. window of that house over there. Uh, not recognised. Nobody know where it is. I happen to know because I remember where the trees were, etc. No blood. It's uh, just the memories. Yes, there should be a blood. Yes, there should be. Definitely. So just a little bit of a geography. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Jack. Um, I have a lot of questions that um, I've prepared, but I'm also really interested in hearing what everyone in the audience would like to ask um, these two um, people we have here today. I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you, Jack, just literally off the top of my head after listening to Greg talk, was just how you sort of feel when you hear your father being spoken about like that in this way, whereas, you know, he was a prisoner of war. He did go through a lot personally as well as, you know, all of the research and um, things he did in his professional life. So, I mean, if you don't mind telling us. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's a great question. To us, he was just dad. Um, little boys, see all these things. It's only later 
to realize that this lovely man gives a very gentle, wonderful person. Uh, he's obviously a terrific doctor. He played tennis better than any of us. He played golf better than any of us. Um, but he was just a lovely, gentle man. Very curious, loved nature, going on picnics. He'd find uh, little animal trails. We'd be driving up to Wood End through the uh, uh, Black Forest and say, Please, do you know the elephants live in this forest? And we it's an African. And five minutes later, we'd pass the circus at the side of the road. He'd seen a pile of darkness by the and he was, he was an intensely curious man and loved nature and uh, was very observant. So it was, you know, one of the, his discovery was what it was. But it was only much later that, really many, many years later, we, like everybody else, realised what he'd done, the enormity of what he'd done, and the national treasure that we had with us all those years. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, one of my questions was um, if you could sort of let the audience know um, the sort of age bracket that you were when you were growing up here, because it was for, you know, part of your childhood here on the side of the hospital, which, as you can see, did in fact take up pretty much the whole suburb that it is now, that we call um, Cooper's Estate. So obviously that's the homestead was the original convalescent farm and then um, everything kind of was built on after that because there was just so much demand, um, obviously because of the subsequent wars as well that um, Australian troops were involved in. So it wasn't just World War II, it was a lot of Vietnam veterans as well um, as others as Arnold and Rosemary would be able to serve us. But yeah, so could you sort of, um, yeah, let us know the age sort of that you were and your memories of living here. I was a seven year old when we moved here after the Second World War. My young brother was five and we just ran about the place. It, it was completely free in those days. There were no sort of safety concerns. Only road bikes everywhere, tramp across the paddocks. The only thing we was get of the snakes. There, there were, it was a very free, happy country life. So by the time leaving was discovered, I was 10, and during the discovery I would have been 9, my brother 7, and we'd go to the lithium lab occasionally, and we'd see the things lying there. Uh, he was there, he would be where you have to pet. And, uh, but I remember those lithium kid bees just lying like this. Kid bees don't do that. They lost their writing reflex, but they're quite content looking around. So these are very vivid memories of a young boy. Uh, a man appearing in the family fridge. Everybody <laughs> does that. <laughs> so, and then um, in the early 1950s, uh, my father was promoted to become the um, psychiatrist superintendent at Royal Park. And Royal Park was an acute receiving psychiatric hospital was the premier psychiatric hospital in the state. And from there, for 25 years, he was the psychiatrist superintendent. And through that hospital, probably a whole generation of Australian New Zealand psychiatrists come through and had some sort of uh, contact. He uh, personally saw every patient for 25 years. Uh, he fostered research in other young people rather than um, doing more personal research. So he saw research not as an entity in its own right, but as an unmeaning for good clinical care. So the, the whole goal was excellence of clinical care for patients. And that uh, surrounding that was teaching and research. And they were part of the uh, sort of total program of a um, I've actually just popped up this slide, which is um, Dr. John K. here, which I believe was taken on site at the family. The front gate? That's right. Uh, the house. Um, and this is Paul Bell. Peter. Peter. That's the family dog. That's Peter. Nice back. smile. And uh, Peter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think John K. would have a cock. Spam cock scared water. 
that mental illness, whether it's schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, whatever it may be, really was so devastating that we had to try things, even if they seemed outrageous. And so John Kane was actually very typical of psychiatrists of his time. They tried bizarre and unusual things because the, the motivation so deep that they felt they couldn't lose anything. You know, you've got to understand that people die all the time from physical illnesses in these mental hospitals, from psychiatric illnesses. The despair was uh, you know, amongst families. I mentioned there were lots of reports of you know, families just dropping off patients and they're just not returning. So in that context, whatever he did had to be better than what existed. That's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is that he was an honourable man. I'm not saying it's just because Jack is sitting next to him. He was deeply religious. He was Catholic. And he would go to church every Sunday. But I'm not thinking so much of religion. It really gave him a kind of moral, a moral compass in life. That he was determined to, to help individuals. And so when he came across with you, it wasn't just an accident that he took it himself. He wouldn't damage another patient without taking it himself. So I think when he discovered that with him could be uh, a great benefit, I think, of course, it, it affected his life tremendously for, for a couple of years. But then he was equally devastated by, by the death of the And it took him some years to come around again. The other thing I want to say is that you mentioned how it affects him as a practitioner, as a psychiatrist. Well, the legacy is that all of a sudden you have a devastating illness like bipolar disorder that, to all intents and purposes, was cured by a lithium. If you know anything about chemistry, it's the lightest metal, it's number three on the periodic table. When the big bang occurred, ladies and gentlemen, only three elements were formed. Hydrogen, helium, and lithium. There's no uh, pharmaceutical, no pharmaceutical company that has a patent on it. It's, it's, you know, it's God who has a patent. And I think that's the legacy. All of a sudden, you know, this, there was this confronting notion that something physical that could be dug out of the earth could profoundly change someone's mood, their cognition, their future, and their family around this particular patient. So I think he was always immensely proud of his discovery, and as I said, it led to a whole flow of investigations around the world that led to other antidepressants, other mood stabilizers, and other antipsychotics. So 
Yes, yeah, so in all kinds of ways, I think it affected him and others. But it was a struggle until he, until lithium was fully accepted. Would you agree, Jack, until the mid to late 50s? Yes, sir. Uh, very well said. And, uh, and as Greg has pointed out, he was a very modest man. In his own book, he didn't even describe himself as the center of lithium. And he was um, he's quietly proud because uh, it had a huge impact on psychiatric care. But he was, he was so modest when eventually, um, because it couldn't be patented, none of the pharmaceutical companies in America would put it through the FDA. So we, in Australia, had lithium for 20 years before it was allowed in America. Of course, America was still very foreign. Mental illness was due to the fact that your grandmother's body training was not right. And it was psychological. Whereas this had reinforced his and others' views of the holistic nature of mental illness and the brain and the body interact in many ways. But his modesty was uh, exemplified when, when eventually it was approved by the FDA after one of the pharmaceutical companies had been persuaded to put it through the philanthropic way because we're not going to make any money. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, won the most prestigious, was awarded the most prestigious psychiatric mm -hmm. award in the United States, so he had to go over and get this award. So he flew over there with this tiny little bag a little briefcase and a spare shirt and a spare socks and a toothbrush and sat in the economy class and off he went. And it was to be presented by uh, President Nixon. It was a very, uh, very big event. And just as he arrived and before the uh, ceremony, of course, Watergate came up. Oh, okay. So the <laughs> Vice President, or now President Ford, made the uh, much lower key. I think that's the point to say. Yeah. One comment there. I think the issue about pharmaceutical company making money out of these discoveries is still relevant in 2021. So lithium uh, is, is not under any sort of patent. So if you look as a psychiatrist, if I'm looking at different medications to treat someone, there's almost no policy. There's no glossy brochures at all for lithium, even though we know for people with certain types of bipolar disorder, it is the gold standard still. And you'll have all these alternative, often more expensive drugs, which are pushed commercially. So it's important that uh, we remember that as, as doctors when we're doing this kind of I don't know, just um, so whether you're going to ask Jack this because it's one of my favourite stories. I was hoping Jack might be able to. I, I really um, would love Jack to relate his memories and stories of Bill Bragg, the first patient that was ever treated. As I mentioned in my presentation, I, as much as I regarded John as a hero, you just got to think about it. In many ways, Bill Bragg is a hero too. Uh, and I know your stories with your brother and others. So uh, if I could impose upon you, Jack, to tell us a little bit about Bill Bragg, the first person ever treated. Well, my brother and I used to roam the, uh, uh, the countryside here at the hospital and we the patients. Um, and we knew Billy Brand, and he was called by everybody the monkey. We didn't call him the monkey, uh, we heard about that later. Uh, but he was restless, grubby, unkempt, uh, a lovely little um, hyper excited little man. And um, he used to get a, a paper bag of humbugs from the Red Cross each week, and he'd share them with us. And he'd bring them down, and we'd sit on a park bench, and Billy would be there, and my brother on either side, and he'd give us his humbug. And he'd make all the humbugs. And he'd say, But you can't swallow them, you've got to spit it out. So we'd be be sitting there, drooling, <laughs> humbug, with this. Black spit, <laughs> which we had at the disposal, we weren't allowed to swallow it. <laughs> so, uh, Billy was, he had great charm and generosity, but he was completely uh, incapable of any um, sort of 
normal human activity like looking after himself and his personal hygiene and uh, he was a he was a lost a lovely little soul. Mm-hmm. Um I think it'd be a good time to open up to the audience just because I don't want to just, you know, take over the whole talk. Thank you, Jeff. Um is there any I'm sure there's lots of questions, but does anyone want to start off? Absolutely anything? A bit shy. Arnold, I know you've got something. <laughs> I've just got one question. Um, William, uh, what's the actual mechanism that causes uh, you know, someone to come down from a, 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 a manic you know, state mm. to calm? How does it actually work? Mm. Well, we just still don't know. Or we, the short answer is we don't know. And it's, it's extraordinary. So, 1948, the first person's treatment, now 2021. And you can find, if you Google Lithium or Google Scholar if you're more academic, and you will find thousands upon thousands of articles about lithium. And we still don't understand. What we know is this. So in 2021, it is more effective for the severe end of bipolar disorder. So it's less useful for people who have more mild and moderate illness, but uh, it's more useful for people who have severe end. We think there are all kinds of theories. I mean, when you look at a, a brain cell, of course it's wrapped in a membrane, and we think it might interact with that membrane, and it alters the way other chemicals move in and out of the cell. There are other theories which I won't go into. I mean, more recently, lithium has been used as a possible anti-dementia medication because it actually preserves brain cells. Uh, and there's a huge amount of research there's been some other research recently, and this is extraordinary, that some lithium is found in natural waterways around the, the, the world. And this is pretty solid research. In the parts of the world where lithium is high in natural springs, actions of violence and suicide are lower. And there's been a recent publication that's come out just in the last 12 months, and people have wondered whether it's related to uh, in, in natural waterways. So it works, that's where it primarily works, but how fundamentally it works at a sort of biochemical level, we still don't know. Now, you might say, well, my father might have said, he's passed away, I said, they're great. Well, that's psychiatry, you know, it's not unlike, you know, if you're a surgeon, you cut something out or whatever. But the truth of the matter, you may disagree with me, Jack, but there's a lot in medicine we don't understand. There's a lot of treatments that we use that we still don't understand the, the fine, fine print. That doesn't mean we don't use it. And I think that's very, very important. The issue of compliance or staying on lithium is, a, is as pertinent today as it was back in the 1940s when your brain stopped taking lithium. But I want to say that this is really important. As a psychiatrist in the early 21st century, Whilst the medicines like lithium are vital and have changed our way of managing patients, lithium is not a panacea. No drug is a panacea for returns. How that person who has bipolar disorder suffers, how we treat them as an individual, looking for their strengths, dealing with their family, and that interaction, that is as vital as any medication we might be given. And that should never, ever be forgotten. Thank you for that. Anyone have anything to add? Oh, well, what Greg, Greg, of course, is quite correct about the extension of that mystery to much medicine. And perhaps the best parallel example is general anaesthesia. We still don't know how general anaesthetic agents fundamentally act on the right. Clearly they do, clearly they're important. Uh, the fact that we don't know their detailed mechanism of action does not at all detract from their clinical use, or clinical utility and uh, widespread use. Mm-hmm. Um, Jack, actually on that topic, could you just tell us a little bit about um, perhaps when you came to the decision, I suppose, when you were finishing high school or starting university that you too wanted to, you know, 
take this um, journey for your profession and your your vocation, I would call it, the labor of love. Um, yeah, what stage you sort of decided that yes, you two would um, undertake that, and you know, your experience in the your very robust career history. Well, I'm, I'm not sure why I went into medicine from school, but it, it was a, a, a sort of a logical thing. But I've done the uh, science subjects, and I knew a lot about medicine. I probably knew more about that than other careers. It looked great, so I went into that. But in, in intensive care I, was the was a, a brand new field at the time, uh, and those of us who were very early in the field virtually had to learn as we went. And the thing that attracted me to intensive care, as opposed to, say, psychiatry or cardiology or things, was it was the great interface between the new technology and clinical care. It was the best example of the marriage of, of complex new technological support with the humanity and the ethics of Clinical care of desperately sick people. And that uh, totality uh, I found uh, fascinating, and that's where my career went. And that did. Um, and also, I guess I was wondering um, sort of thoughts that are ruminating around in my mind as we're hearing all of this is did your father, um, John Cade, ever talk about his experience as a POW? Was it something that he sort of hid from the from the kids? Uh, it's an interesting question, and for many diggers, uh, probably most of them, they never talked about it. Again. He didn't ever talk about it to his family, certainly not to us. I don't think to his wife, um, even 20, 30 years later. Uh, the only occasions uh, which it came up on Anzac Day at the, uh, the shrine with his former Sigma Phil Ambulance buddies, and they would reminisce, but they wouldn't reminisce about glory things, but they'd be reminiscing about their lost friends and colleagues and how much they missed them. And um, it was very moving. I've seen some of his little speeches that he made to his colleagues. But he didn't ever talk about it. Uh, this was very common. And in fact, you probably heard of weary Donalds or War Diaries, and they were 40 years later. We all were so, um, maybe just because they're men, and, and men don't share these things well, and they internalised it. It wasn't that it was forgotten, it was buried, could not be shared. There is good psychological reasons for that, but uh, that's the way it was. Mm. It's interesting, you know, that because um, we really done a lot in John Cade for boxes as well, and I think they lost one another around Melbourne University. One thing, just um, again, I'd love to, just in terms of perspective, I'm trying to, what I love about the story, and while I, my background's maths and science and so on, as I've grown older, I've understood that. Great stories and storytelling is probably what I love most. And there's a writer's perspective. And you, you go through and do research, you try and articulate, find the right words and you communicate, you take some medical knowledge, some scientific knowledge, you take literary skills. But I think there are all ways, there are many different ways of taking a wonderful story like this and illuminating it, which is why I'm so interested in Shannon's work. In that we don't want to put Shannon on the spot because she may not want to say anything. But uh, if I could reverse it just for a minute, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I, you know, when I look at an artist's creation, the first thing I know is that I couldn't do it. There's something about whatever it is about the way my mind works. Uh, I don't have those, those skills. But I, I look at it and wonder, and you look at the shapes, and you look at the patterns and the colour and all the effort and the detail that you must have thought to create what you did. I hope that I'm right if I ask you a question. Yeah. Is when you hear a story like this, which ostensibly is historical Australian 
and has this deep scientific thread through it. How do you as an artist try and produce what you produce? And how do you come back? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, I do it tacitly, I think. Do you want to say that? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm an educator as well, so my voice does I start with that. Um, so if you can't hear me, feel free to speak up. Um, I think I kind of tacitly bring on board all of these things. So the stories that we told in the book, um, the anecdotes from John's family that were woven into that text. Um, I came and was lucky enough to come along to one of the history tours that you two gave um, and took sort of certain things that you said and had conversations about colour, conversations about the space, um, conversations about the carpet took on board all of these sorts of stories and internalised them and let them percolate and probably do a really terrible way. Or explaining this in a really terrible way, but let them percolate within myself and I'm really conscious of not um, putting forward any words, so to speak, um, through the work. I just, I just kind of want to take what I've heard and what I've experienced and what I've seen of this site and bring it together and push forward this sort of visualisation, if you like, of something that um, might be spoken about or written about, but it's not often existing in kind of a form. Um, so that's how this sort of installation came to be. It's a, it's a distillation of all these different stories and these different things that I've heard, um, and then it's filtered through my own sort of aesthetic consciousness, if you like. Um, I'm really interested in clean and minimal form, I'm really interested in the idea of institutional critique, so taking, um, finding out about the site and flipping it, thinking about it from a different perspective, um, critiquing it in some way, in a soft way, not in a hard hitting way necessarily, um, and putting what I find forward you know, in a kind of um, visual and sometimes gentle way. Um, within this site, it was really important for me to. Um, consider the really personal aspects of John's story. Um, and I was, I was kind of taken particularly with this idea or with something that you've written, Greg, um, about an instance where John was speaking to his father and his back was up against the fireplace. Yes. Um, so when I was looking at that site initially, uh, the dining room site, it struck me that there was this amazing fireplace. Um, <laughs> With a piece of oven, and that was the most dominant thing in the room, essentially, apart from maybe the, the chandeliers. <laughs> um, so that part of John's story kind of pushed forward for me, um, and I knew that that had to be in the room. And just on that, my just like why that resonates with me, I told you my relationship with my father, which mm-hmm. all father and son stories has strengths and uh, hard moments, and that particular moment. Chan's talking about. This was a, a moment in the book where John's excited. He thinks he's onto something. You know, no one has discovered. So as a boy, you go to your dad. And you know, what you want is you want your dad to say, that's great. Mm-hmm. Instead, what often happens, and what happened to John was that his dad didn't quite understand what his son was on about. It was diffident bit standoffish because his personality is from a different generation and John was deeply, deeply disappointed that his father didn't give him the kind of confirmation mm-hmm. of that excitement. Um, and so I'm struck with you that, that, yeah. that you noted that. That was a really important point. And then you create, so I just went and had a look at uh, something, uh, part of your, your work and you had the You've reconstructed Shannon, I think, the sink where John Cave had done experiments, and you had um, a strategic points in the sink. You had cups of but for tea because cup drinking tea and having cigarettes was uh, very strategic important to John Cave. You had to set times during the day. It was somewhat methodical then, um, with the metronomic efficiency. But again, the, the sad thing about that is that as you know, Jack can recall, and of course it was after my time, that that particular building where this historic work was done, with guinea pigs to discover lithium that led to this mental health revolution, mm-hmm. sometime during the 1980s, as I understand it, Jack, the family, I think, wrote to the then state government 
asking that it be preserved, but it was, was pulled down. And you just look at that space and you think, you know, would you pull down the laboratory where Alexander Fleming discovered cancer? And you just wonder about this small, the inhibited mindset of the government, whatever the state, whatever colour, not to preserve something like that. So hopefully, as we alluded to earlier, Sophie, we can resurrect something, whether it be a plaque or something of significance to to commemorate that site where really the, the history of the treatment of the Israel forever will be changed. Absolutely. Well, I'm amazed that when we were working here, we had no idea of this story and, and the importance Is of that right? Yes. Well, I wish we had your book there. Um, <laughs> I, I feel quite ashamed that we had no idea. And I mean, to think that the house was still on site then, you know, it, it's a shame. And, some, you know, somebody of such importance, not only in medicine, but in, in Australian life, you know, it's so... I don't have to tell you where. Not the size. I, I, I worked for one of these drove me was, I, I lived for a year in the United States. I worked as a psychiatrist in Manhattan. <laughs> and um, I do tell the story, and our most famous patient was Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. So I was in Manhattan, worked as a psychiatrist, and uh, every Monday, Woody Allen would come in to Cornell University Medical Centre in Manhattan. And every uh, 9 o'clock, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, Woody Allen would walk in for his analysis. And I always remember he always looked incredibly depressed. And then one hour later, he looked just as depressed as he had before. And he seen his psychiatrist. And if you knew his psychiatrist who was my boss, you'd understand why Woody Allen was always depressed. <laughs> But it was, well, it was during my time in Manhattan, which was <laughs> good business, good yeah. money. But it was, it was during my time in Manhattan, we had a medical meeting. We had what we called Grand Rounds, where we had a huge lecture theater with hundreds of psychiatrists from all over New York. And at the end of it, we had a big lunch. And I was parading around as a visiting Australian. And the only Australian that knew was Steve Irwin. <laughs> and I would be a cloud or something. I remember I spoke to them briefly after that, uh, one of the lunches, and I said, you know, John Kay discovered with him. And again, you could have heard a pin drop. There wasn't a single American there, I think, who knew that story. And I got so determined, and this was a bit of a nationalistic pride, I thought, it was like so typical that something so wonderful which is out, is not known beyond it. It's not even known in the national But one of the things that drove me actually to write the book was that I like that idea of we should expect, uh, export the story into the world. Because this is a fantastic story. Could you imagine the Americans <laughs> a story like this and they're not telling anyone? But beyond that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Film runs coming soon. Um, I will end with just one question each for both of you, and it's not going to be an easy one. <laughs> um, so, Jack, um, aside from the obvious earth shattering of um, Desi, um, Discovery by Dr. K, what would you like people to know about your father? And you can take a moment to think about this because I guess. We know he was a good guy, and we know he was, you know, like he had all, yeah, I guess something that you would want people to know about him, and not just like the man, the myth, the legend sort of thing. Well, I think people would I'd like people to know him as a, a kind, modest, intelligent man who cared for his and a fellow human beings greatly, and who made an extraordinary discovery. But it wasn't a fluke. Uh, Pasteur said chance favours the prepared mind. He was very intelligent. He was a, a very deeply committed doctor. Knowledge of medicine was very good. He loved the natural world and observation. He had this extraordinary moving experience in Changi, where, and, and as a young man, psychiatric course was 
where he saw the divine on the mind. So uh, I would like people to recognize it as an extraordinary achievement which was a natural progression from a very special person. And although he modestly said, look, I really was just an old prospect who had to put my hand in the barrel and pull out a note. That was his view. But I think that's, uh, uh, that's playing it down. And it was really quite extraordinary for very good reasons. That's really well said. And um, Greg, just one final one for you. I think we have heard a number of sort of your um, findings with your research that have really been pivotal throughout the process for you of um, this project, this ongoing project, I would call it. Um, but I guess, is there an aspect of information that like really re resonated with you and perhaps caught you off guard? I'm sure there's lots of these moments and I know that you've spoken about the you know, when you spoke to the nurse and throughout different interviews and just things that propelled you forward, but was there something that just really, I don't know, it caught, like you just really didn't expect it, I guess? The two things I'd like to say to that. Um, one is that if you're well, if you're healthy, physically and mentally healthy, it's difficult to fully appreciate what some people in life go through, whether it be physical ill health or mental ill health. And when I discovered your brain's life, what he had gone through, the way he had been treated, the way he had lived on the streets, the way he had been spurned by the medical community as fabricating symptoms. It just kind of drove home to me this is what some people go through. And it isn't just a title like a or any other title. The people live their sort of lives. And in a world that we've seen in the last few months that you know parliament that often lacks sensitivity generosity and humanity. We've got a long way to go in the way we treat one another. That's one thing. The second thing I'd like to say is, and I've only alluded to because it's, it's a little bit on the edge of the John Cain story. And this is a story I love and I'm researching at the moment. I mentioned to you how lithium was discovered, that if you give too much lithium, though, it can make you toxic. If you give the right amount, it's, it's fine. The key person who made that discovery of working out, could do blood tests to work out the right amount of lithium, that was a German refugee. A refugee who was fleeing Nazi Germany. He fled Nazi Germany, he fled to England, and Churchill didn't like having him along with the other Germanic people in England. So the English did what they do best. They loaded him onto a ship and sent him to Australia. And he came here on a ship called the Danura. And he was in a refugee camp in western New South Wales and then outside Titura in Victoria. And he was discovered there by a professor at Melbourne University. And that refugee from Nazism, from Churchill, ending in a refugee camp. And doesn't this have a lot to read about it? Was discovered, and it was he, more than anyone else, who rescued this idea of lithium by finding and doing blood tests. So, those two things can we treat one another? is important, but also that idea of you know, refugees have given a lot to this nation, and it links in with the story. Well, I think that just about wraps it up in case anyone has any questions, but I'm sure um, Professor Jack and Dr. Greg would be happy to answer some one on ones if you don't want to ask it out loud. Um, but thank you so much for your time. I know it is precious.
And um, yeah, this is wonderful. And I'm so glad it was filmed so more people can uh, hear about it too. Thank you. Thank you.